I would now like to introduce our physician speaker, and Dr. Neville is already on camera. Dr. Neville is Dr. Richard Neville is chairman of Inova's Department of Surgery, associate director of Inova Heart and Vascular Institute, and he also serves as system director of vascular surgery. Dr. Neville joined Inova Medical Group with more than 25 years of clinical experience. He has consistently been named to the best doctors in America and Washingtonian top docs. His clinical interests include lower extremity revascularization, wound healing, amputation prevention, car carotid artery treatment for stroke prevention, as well as hemodialysis access. More recently, Dr. Neville served as professor in the Department of Surgery and as the Ludwig Chief of Vascular Surgery at George Washington University. Prior to that position, he was Chief of Vascular Surgery at Georgetown University. Dr. Neville practices at the Inova Vascular Fairfax office location at the Inova Specialty Center, which is located on Inova Innovation Park Drive in Fairfax, Virginia. Dr. Neville, thank you very much for your time tonight, um, and the floor is all yours. Oh, thank you, Ron. I appreciate uh, your, your uh, uh, patience and your uh, efforts with you and Quine to put this together. I really appreciate it. Let me see if I can share my screen so that people can see the slides. Great. Can you see that? Is that okay? Looks good. Yeah. Okay, great. So what we are going to talk about tonight is understanding something called peripheral arterial disease. Uh, and I'll tell you a little bit about what it is and how we try to diagnose it and some of the new treatments that we can come up with to help people that have this problem. Uh, I apologize in advance. You might hear me cough every once in a while. I think one of the best bits of advice I can give you this evening is if your grandchildren have a cold, stay away from them because you'll you'll catch it. So I apologize if I cough once in a while because those darn grandkids gave it to me. So this is peripheral arterial disease. What is it? Well, it's basically a blockage in your arteries and it starts out, uh, you can see this is an artery here on the left-hand portion of the slide. And as we get a little older, and as we get a little wear and tear in our arteries, we begin to develop some blockages in the arteries. You can see that here in the middle. And the blockage initially starts as a little bit of injury to the art lining of the artery, and then the artery tries to repair itself. And when the artery tries to repair itself, sometimes it kind of over repairs itself. And that's where cholesterol and things like that come into play because cholesterol gets mixed into the body trying to repair itself. And you can see it starts to block the artery off. And then after cholesterol, the next thing that comes usually is some hardening or some calcium that the body lays down to try to heal things and try to keep the artery open. But that also leads to more blockages. So this is the enemy. This is what we're trying to uh, treat and overcome. And you can see I included a little picture here of what this looks like when we actually take it out of the body. So this is of some of the plaque or some of the cholesterol and calcium and blockage that you can see. And this is what it looks like actually when you remove it from the body. And, you know, I think in this country, we aren't very good at diagnosing peripheral arterial disease. We're pretty good at diagnosing heart disease. Everybody knows what heart disease is, and everybody knows that if you have a little bit of chest pain, you should call your doctor or come to the emergency room. The American Heart Association has been very good about that. We have not been so good about telling people about PAD, or peripheral arterial disease, and that's what I'll try to tell you tonight. We probably underdiagnose it in this country. There's probably a lot of people walking around with PAD that really aren't sure that they have it or don't know they have it. There's a lot of patients that think, well, the pain and the, and the, the problems associated with PAD, PAD are just part of getting old and you can't do anything about it. And that's not true. As a matter of fact, there was a very interesting article published in England that showed that English doctors, when they went to get their physicals uh, every year, they didn't even tell their own doctors about the symptoms of PAD and didn't realize they had it sometimes. So I think this is some place, something we can really help people with and have an impact and, and prevent the problems associated with PAD. So let's talk about it a little bit. So what does PAD do? Well, here you can see is a little cartoon. This is someone's leg. And you can see here are the arteries in the leg. 
And here you can see the blockage in the artery that we just showed in the picture before. And this blockage can either block off the artery and block the flow, sort of like a dam in the river, or a little bit of this blockage can break off and travel and go farther down and block something farther down the line. But what this, what this disease does is it blocks blood flow to, the, to your tissues. It blocks blood flow to the leg so that the legs, muscles, and skin and bones aren't getting enough oxygen and nutrients to stay alive. Well, who gets this PAD? Well, probably one of the most powerful uh, indicators is your family. So you can always blame your parents or your grandparents. There certainly is a genetic predisposition to get this, although it's not, it's not always the case. So just because you have a family history, you can certainly do some things about the other reasons you might get it to reduce your risk. But certainly family history and genetics play a role. Smoking plays a huge role. So certainly if you have a family history and just even in general, people should really give up tobacco use, especially if you have any of the symptoms of PAD. If you continue to smoke, uh, your symptoms will definitely get worse. If you have diabetes, that puts you at increased risk for getting this PAD. If you have high blood pressure, that also gives you increased risk for this PAD because it tends to start that little injury in the side of the artery that we talked about that the artery then tries to heal. And if you have a high cholesterol, especially high lipids, that can also make you more prone to get these blockages. As you remember from that earlier cartoon that showed how the cholesterol and the lipids get put down into the artery once the injury starts. And this is on the rise around the world. This is a major healthcare problem around the world, not just the United States of America. Diabetes is exploding around the world, and we're seeing PAD just really start to, to become recognized and to actually get worse. So I think we're recognizing it better, but I think there's also some good data to show that it's occurring more frequently um, in all continents and all countries around the world, causing the healthcare systems around the world uh, many billions of dollars to take care of this problem. And it's no, 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 no surprise as to why this is. Um, you know, I actually uh, uh, lecture in internationally. I've been to around the world, most, most continents, have not been to Australia yet. But as here, you can see some pictures that I took when I was visiting some places around the world. And we're exporting, we're exporting some of the reasons people get PAD uh, to other countries. This is a, an interesting picture I took. This was actually in London, uh, the American food store. Well, what do you think is in the American food store? If you look closely, the American foods are chips, soda, candy, and instant meals. So these are the kind of things that give you atherosclerosis and blockages in the arteries. Our American diet just tends to not help us. So what's the impact of this process? How important is it? Well, over 10 million people in the country have it, and about 1 million new patients uh, that have Medicare are getting PAD annually. So you can see this is increasing rapidly. About one third of patients over the age of 70 will at least have some blockages in their arteries. This doesn't mean that they need surgery or necessarily need any treatment, but at least one third of patients will have some evidence of PAD um, and, and may need some therapy to prevent things from getting worse. If you have PAD, you're probably also at increased risk for a heart attack or a stroke because you have blockages in the heart arteries and blockages in the brain arteries like you do in the leg. So you're a little more prone to get these other processes too. And of course, there's significant health effects when we try to take care of patients with PAD. And you can see if it's untreated and we don't uh, try to intervene and help people with PAD, the mortality or the death rate from PAD is actually only thing higher is lung cancer and pancreatic cancer. There's many other disease processes which have a lower mortality rate than PAD. And this is something we need to let people know. We need to let our primary care physicians and our family practice doctors and our medical doctors, if someone has PAD, even if they don't treat the PAD aggressively, even if you don't need me to operate on you for your PAD, we should at least think about helping control it so we can reduce the chance of heart attack and stroke, as well as maintain the leg and the lower extremity. So it's a very important indicator 
that you may have atherosclerosis somewhere else in the body as well. So we've started a society to help raise awareness about this, you know, just like the American Heart Association did with heart disease. We started the CLI Global Society. CLI stands for critical or important limb ischemia. So atherosclerosis in the leg that's causing significant problems. And this is a society that we're trying to raise awareness around the world. Uh, we're working very closely with the American Diabetes Association uh, on an amputation prevention program. So we're starting to raise awareness and people are starting to learn more and more about PAD, which I think will be really beneficial uh, for the healthcare of our nation. So what are the symptoms that you might have if you get PAD? Well, the first thing you might feel is called claudication. It's actually named after the emperor Claudius. Claudius was a emperor in ancient Rome and he used to limp around. Now, I don't know if he had claudication, but it got named after him. So claudication is pain when you walk and it happens in the same leg, in the same part of the muscle every time. So it doesn't happen in your foot one time and then your hip another time and then your knee another time. It happens in the same muscle, usually down in your calf muscle, but it happens in the same muscle every time. It's very reproducible because the blockages don't change very rapidly. So if the blockages aren't changing, then you're going to have the same symptoms every time. So when people go to walk or they go to walk up a, a hill or up an incline, they usually get pain in their calf muscle, which makes them stop. And then when they stop and rest, that pain gets better and goes away. So if the pain goes away, that's also consistent with claudication because now your muscles aren't using, they're not as active and they don't use as much oxygen. They go back to a resting state and the symptoms get better. So it's not like if you sprain your ankle or you, you pull a muscle in your hip that the pain kind of continues no matter what you're doing. This pain gets worse when you're walking in the same muscle every time and it gets better when you stop. But as I mentioned earlier, even doctors won't even tell their own doctors that they have these symptoms. A lot of people don't like to tell people that they're having pain when they walk. So what does uh, claudication mean? Well, the, the thing about claudication is most of the time, it's a pretty stable condition. Your leg's not in danger. Now, I have a lot of people that come into my office and they're sent in to me to, to treat them or to evaluate them for their claudication. And we do some testing, which I'll show you in a second, some ultrasound tests with just a little bit of jelly on your skin. And we know that we can show that your blood supply is actually pretty good. It's not normal. That's why you have claudication. But it's good enough that we're not worried about your leg. And if we can just treat your claudication, you'll be OK. And most people are very relieved to know that that's the case, that they don't need you know, major surgery, they don't, they're not worried about getting an amputation or anything like that, God forbid. So we can treat their claudication, keep them going. And it's a, usually a, a very stable situation if you get treated properly. Now, there are people that go on to be at risk for losing the limb, about 10%. Those are usually people that keep smoking or people that have diabetes that's a little out of control. And as I mentioned earlier, we want to make sure that when someone has claudication, that we're also looking at their heart to make sure they don't have heart disease and their neck arteries so they're not going to have a stroke. So how do we treat claudication? Well, the best way to treat claudication is, first of all, to get people to stop smoking. Just you got to stop smoking. After we get them to stop smoking, then we get you in an ex a supervised exercise program. And I'm very proud to say that we have one here at Inova. Not many places have them. Not many places put the resources into these supervised exercise programs. Most places around the country just say, well, go home and walk. Go home and walk a little bit. Well, not here. Here, we're going to, we would get you into a supervised program, um, which uh, uh, insurance and Medicare usually covers the cost of, so that you can really get some good uh, therapy in, 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 at the same time as your walking program and what you're really trying to do is you're trying to sort of like a marathon runner, like a, a, a long distance runner. You're training your body to get more blood down to the leg and to the muscle so that the pain gets better. So that takes care of, of most people. Now, there is a medicine that we try. It's called Platol. The chemical name is Salastazole. And that helps about 
50 to 75 percent of people. So I usually offer it to people. What we do is we tell them to take one pill twice a day, and then I would see you back in three months, and you would tell me if it's working or not. Some people come in the office and say, yeah, this is good. I'm much better. Well, then we would keep it going. Some people say, well, you know, it's really not doing much. If it's not doing much at three months, then it's not worth continuing. We'll just stop it, and we'll keep you on the exercise therapy. So claudication is usually the first symptom. It's pain when you walk. It gets better when you stop. We can treat it. And it doesn't necessarily mean you're going to, God forbid, lose a leg, but you still have to get it checked out. So if the next step after that, if we don't, you know, uh, if, if we can't stop your atherosclerosis and, and things get worse, then you get into a set situation called limb threatening ischemia. So now your leg is at risk. And I'm sorry about these ugly pictures, but I think people need to see what can happen. So this can happen when you get sores on your foot or you can get some gangrene changes in your foot. Now your foot and your leg are at risk. Now we have to do something because we don't want you to end up with an amputation. We want to do everything we can to prevent that. The first thing you might notice is called rest pain. That's pain at night. And it's not just cramps. It's not a, not a cramp at night. This is such bad pain down in your foot that most people hang their leg over the bed to make the pain feel better. And what that means is that means now the leg is not even getting enough blood supply to keep it going, um, even if you're not walking. So that's the first sign is what's called rest pain. The next sign after rest pain, if we don't do something about it, is that's when you can start getting wounds or ulcers on your foot, like you can see on this picture, or some gangrene, which is dead tissue, which you can see in this foot and on this foot. And then we really have to do something or you might end up with an amputation. And, and what can we do? Well, I'll show you some pictures in a minute, but we can get more blood flow in the leg. And there's two ways to do that. One way is called endovascular. And that's kind of like you put a little catheter into the artery and you can open up the artery with a balloon. And some people need a stent. Um, a lot of people come into my office and they say, oh, can I have a stent? Well, you can have a stent, but not everybody needs a stent. And we put stents in when that's the right thing to do. And then in about 25% of people, the blockages are so bad that you really need surgery and a bypass operation to, to save the leg. So how do we know? How do we know if you have enough blood supply or not? How do we know if you need one of those procedures or if we can tell you, go home, walk, see if you do better, let's treat you medically and see how you do. Well, the first step we would do would be we would send you to our vascular laboratory, which is, again, not invasive. It's just some jelly on the skin. And the first thing that they would do is they would get what's called an ankle brachial index or an ABI. That's kind of like our EKG. You know, you've heard of an EKG with the cardiologists. They use it to look at the function of your heart. Well, we look at this to look at the blood flot supply in the leg. And you can see here the technician, you put a blood pressure cuff down on the ankle and you listen with this little probe. This is a little ultrasound probe. They're really, really good. They can hear flow very nicely. And you put a little of this jelly down here on your ankle over the artery and you inflate this blood pressure cuff and you kind of get a blood pressure of the foot. And then we compare it to the blood pressure in your arm. And that's how we come up with this index. And after we do that, we can do many more ultrasound tests. And I won't go over all of these, but these are all tests which can tell us about the blood supply to the leg. So when we say we send people to the vascular lab, it's not like a blood test. It's not like one test where you you send it off to the lab and get a result. It's a whole battery of data. It's a whole set of information that we get from our ultrasounds, and we can really make a very good determination uh, based on all this information that we get from ultrasound. The only thing, other thing I'll say about this is you really should go to an accredited lab. There's lots of places out there that just try to open up labs on their own, and they don't do very good quality control and we have them sometimes people come into our office after going to a non-accredited lab and we always have to repeat the tests because they're never done quite right.
So I would, wherever you go, we'd be glad to help you in our system, but wherever you go, always make sure you look for an accredited lab and ask them if they are accredited by the national uh, accrediting body. So after we get the ultrasound, if we decide that you do need something done, like if you have a sore on your foot or God forbid, there's some little gangrene there, some dead tissue where we, need, we figure we need to do something to save your limb. Well, the next step is I need to get a roadmap. I need to get a map to tell me well, exactly what we need to do. The ultrasound test, it's kind of like when I explained it to the residents, is the, the ultrasound test kind of tells you if you need to make the trip. These kind of tests tell you how to make the trip, and they're like a roadmap for the trip. The trip is the treatment. So we can do it several ways. We can get a CAT scan. You can see here's a CAT scan, and this yellow material is the blood, and you can see there's blockage in the artery right here. It's not getting through very well there. We can do an MRI or an MRA, and sometimes we have to do an arteriogram where we put a little tiny needle into the artery up near your leg and we inject some liquid, which gives us very good pictures. You can see this is all the way down on the bottom of the foot, and I can see every little blood vessel going to every part of the foot. So the arteriogram is oftentimes very important. So these are the kind of studies that we get, which really help us decide what to do and how to do it if we think you need more blood into your leg, either to get things to heal, so one of the wounds to heal, or, you know, God forbid, to prevent an amputation. This is very important pictures to tell us exactly what to do. So once we, we see you, we hear what your symptoms are, we have you go to our non-invasive vascular lab for some tests and some jelly on the skin and to see exactly how much blood flow you're getting. Then we get the pictures of the arteries so that we can see exactly what we need to do. Well, then there's two choices. So one choice is what I mentioned before, it's the endovascular. So you can see that here on the right-hand side. Here we are, we're getting ready to put a small needle into the artery here, and then we work through that needle to do things like angioplasty or put in a stent or whatever it is we need to do. And you can see here that the patient is awake. The patient is drowsy but awake, so we don't have to put you to sleep to do that. So it is less invasive than surgery. There's no incision. There's no cutting, there's no incision made. It's all done through needle punctures. Um, so if we can do it this way, that's what we'll do. And we can do that about 75% of the time. But about 25% of the time, you can see here on the left, we actually have to do a bypass operation, which means we have to make some incisions on the leg and stitch the artery and do a little bypass around the blockage. And I'll show you some pictures of that. So here's that endovascular therapy. There's a picture of that. And you can see here on the right, here's a balloon, an angioplasty balloon going inside the artery. And when you inflate the balloon, it opens up the blockage right here, you can see. The problem is sometimes that blockage comes back a little bit. So we have to put a stent in to sort of hold things open. So sometimes we put a stent into the blockage to hold it open. And then sometimes we use something called atherectomy that's kind of like a rotor rooter. It can kind of clean the artery out. Um, we don't use it all the time, but we use it when we think it's we need to and it's appropriate. It's not best for everybody, but it's good for some people. So these are some of the examples of the kind of things we would do with endovascular therapy, which is this procedure here where the patient's awake and we're working just through a little needle at the top of the leg. And you can see here's some pictures here. Here's the dark material is the blood, and you can see the blood trying to get down through the leg, and then it's totally blocked to getting into the foot here. And you can see over here, here's a, a, a balloon that we put all the way down the bottom of the foot. These balloons are getting so small and so good that we can put them down into places where we couldn't reach before. And now we've got great blood flow to the foot. You can see that here on this middle picture. Whereas before there was hardly any getting into the foot, now there's very good blood flow getting to the foot. So endovascular therapy is angioplasty, sometimes a stent, sometimes this rotor rooter called atherectomy, and there's actually many other devices we can use as well, but these are the, the main ones. But as I said, about 25% of the time, we do have to do a bypass to save the leg. And you can see here on the left, 
Here's the artery coming down into the leg. So we have to stitch a graft here, and then the blood goes through the graft around the blockage into the artery farther down. And you can see here's a leg where we've made a couple incisions and we're doing our bypass around all the blockages to get the blood farther down. And sometimes we try to use your own vein for the bypass. You can see here and you can see here's our stitches where we stitch the artery, the vein very carefully. Here's the artery going down to the leg and the foot. So the blood's going to come down through this vein and into this artery and go down into the foot. But some people don't have a very good vein to use. So what do we do then? If you don't have a very good vein, or maybe some people have had that vein used, maybe they've had a heart bypass. It's the same vein that the heart surgeons use for heart bypass. So I had to come up with this idea, actually. I invented this, actually, back in, well, I guess it was probably the early 2000s, 2001 or so, where we use a man-made tube and put a little piece of vein between the man-made tube and the artery, and it makes the man-made tube work very much better. So in the past, if you didn't have a vein to use, we would say, oh, nothing can be done. Sorry, you're out of luck. But now we have a very nice technique to do um, in those kind of situations. So bypass is still a great procedure. It can get a very good blood supply to the leg and save a lot of legs. But as you can see by this picture, it is a little more invasive. There's our, there are incisions that have to be made, and the recovery is a little longer. So if we can do it with these endovascular techniques, then we will uh, certainly try to use those first. And you can see here's my own data. Here's information from my own practice where the number of vein bypasses we're doing is getting fewer because we're doing more of those endovascular procedures. And here's that, this is that DVP bypass that I invented, and that's about the same. So we're doing more and more of these angioplasty procedures and fewer and fewer vein bypasses but this group will probably always keep doing because those are the patients that don't have a very good vein to use. So the last thing I'll leave you with is this is definitely a, a team approach. You really need a group of people and a group of specialists to help treat this disease. I can't do it alone. So we have put together a great team here at ANOVA. We've got the vascular piece, that's myself and my partners. We've got an excellent podiatry group, so people that can take care of the foot. We've got a great wound care program, very proud of our wound care centers. We've got four wound care centers in the system and we're thinking of adding more. So if I get good blood supply into the leg, then our podiatrist and our wound care centers, they will get you to heal because it's very frustrating to get the blood down there, but then not have good podiatry and good wound care to get things to go on to heal. We're working very closely with our orthotics people so people can help you with the proper footwear, which is also very important. So after we do get blood supply into the leg, we wanna make sure your shoes fit properly so they don't cause a problem. We've got great vascular nurses in our practice and great vascular nurse practitioners. Very, very proud of the group we've put together. They are really, really good um, and very proud of them. We've got a great vascular lab system you know, five years ago when we started, there was only one vascular lab. Now we have uh, at least 15 and growing. We have six vascular labs just in our office across the street here in our main office. So you can see what kind of, once you, once you tell people you have this capability, uh, the th things do grow. We started with one lab, we now have 15. We need good support from our medical doctors. As you remember, people that have PAD, oftentimes have hypertension, they have diabetes. So we need good advice and support from our medical doctors to help us with those problems. And our cardiologists, if, if someone has a heart problem, we wanna make sure they get their heart uh, treated. Our endocrinologists, if you have diabetes, and our infectious disease doctors to make sure that if you do have an infection, that's adequately treated. And all of this, all of this put together is centered and focused around the patient. So that's the other thing we're trying to build in our system. We don't want to have the patient to have to go to all these individual offices and get all these different types of treatment. That's too much moving, too much traveling around. So we're setting up a system where the patient will come to one place or as few places as possible, and all these specialists can help treat that patient very quickly, very conveniently, um, with as few visits as possible.
So I'm very excited by the program we've put together and are growing. Um, and it truly is the team approach to this problem. That's one thing that I do get asked to go around the country and around the world and lecture about. People want to know, you know, how we've set up our team so that they can try to do it in their locations. So I'm very, very proud of the team we have and think it serves our patients very well. So I know that was a lot. I apologize, but I hope everyone got a, a got something out of it. This is our PAD center over across the street in the ICPH complex. And this is our team. I'm very, very proud of our team. We've really grown this dramatically from just a couple folks a couple years ago um, to now. These are all our providers and our APPs and our nurses. It really is a great team. And I think if you if you if you do need us, I think you will we're there for you, and I think you'll you'll have a great experience uh, because of this group. So uh, thank you very much for your attention. I'd be glad to answer any questions. Thank you, Dr. Neville. Uh, we have quite a few questions. If you want to take down your your screen sharing. Oh, oh goodness, let me see. Okay. <laughs> and then we'll we get go. to the questions. Got it, got it. <laughs> okay, so looks good. Okay, good. All righty. I'm going to read the questions to you. We also have a few that were sent in um, before the webinar. And okay, I just good. want to remind people that if they still have questions, they can still put them in the Q&A. Again, please put them in the Q&A rather than the chat. Sounds good. Okay, the first question is, I've just been diagnosed with AFib. How is that related to PAD? So AFib is not really directly related. Um, they're two different things. Excuse me. <coughs> I warned you about those grandkids. It's not directly related. AFib is more of the electrical system of your heart. And we have an amazing uh, electrophysiology group here led by Dr. Atwater, who does great work with AFib. But AFib and PAD are two kind of separate things. Okay. Does night leg cramps with uh, congestive heart failure mean heart disease and stroke get higher or the risk is higher perhaps? Yeah, I, that's a great question, Rona. I get asked that a lot. So if you get cramps at night and you have a history of congestive heart failure, probably, and that you should still get things checked out obviously, but most likely what happens is during the day, because of your congestive heart failure, your veins are having a little bit of a hard time returning the blood to the heart. Because of the congestive heart failure, the veins, so arteries take blood into the leg. That's what we've been talking about mostly tonight. That's PAD. PAD is blockages in your arteries that take blood into the leg. The veins take the blood out of the leg. And when you have congestive heart failure, it makes a little harder for the veins to get the blood out of your leg, back to the heart. So the blood through the day tends to sort of pool in your leg a little bit, it tends to sort of stay in the leg. And that can give you a little bit of swelling. So people can have swelling towards the end of the day. And it can also give you some night cramps because what happens is your veins kind of get a little more filled up all day and then at night, they're, they're bursting. They've got so much blood that's trying to get back to the heart that they cause pain and cramping on the, sorry, on the muscles around them. So cramping pain at night, if you have congestive heart failure, is usually from what we call venous insufficiency. The veins in your legs aren't returning the blood properly. So walking is still good. And if you can use some light support socks during the day, that's often beneficial. And then stretch a little bit and try to stretch out the muscles before you go to bed at night. Okay, thank you. This person would like to know, could varicose veins that burst cause peripheral arterial disease? Yeah, that's a good question too. Again, two separate systems. So varicose veins don't cause PAD. Um, there was actually a very good study done in the VA system several years ago and they found no connection. So there's no connection between varicose veins and PAD. Now, you can certainly get your varicose veins treated because you don't like your varicose veins. <laughs> so varicose veins, some people don't like them because they hurt. Some people don't like them because they don't look nice. And they can burst, although that's pretty rare. It's pretty rare for a varicose vein to rupture and bleed. It can happen, but it's pretty rare. But um, And so you can have your varicose veins treated for those reasons, and we certainly do that in our practice too. We have a big vein practice. But that's very different than PAD, two opposite sides of the body, so to speak. 
All righty. This person is asking how much of these tests and treatments, for example, the, the vascular lab tests, right. are covered by standard Medicare? Uh, they're almost all covered. It, they're covered. Um, the only thing we've we've been asking, so two, they, they're covered, but what we have been asking Medicare to do, and I actually went down on Capitol Hill and knocked on doors, we're asking them to be more aggressive and pay for screening. So right now, if you come into my office and I think you need one, I order it, you get it, they pay for it. But, you know, there are some people that have a family history, that have bad diabetes, that have that have smoked, that have bad hypertension. We're trying to we're trying. That's what that I, mean, I showed you the picture of our society. So our society is trying to lobby Congress to say that we need more awareness and more screening so that people come into my office before they develop those gangrene and ulcers that that we want to prevent. So we're trying to get the government to pay for screening. And right now they haven't started doing that yet. They will screen for aneurysms. So they will pay for they will pay for one ultrasound when you get to a certain age if you have a family history of an aneurysm. Now an aneurysm is a different thing. An aneurysm is like a bubble on your artery that can burst. That's not a blockage. So that's a totally different process. But the government has agreed to pay for screening for aneurysms, but they haven't yet allowed payment for screening for PAD. But if I think you need it, they'll pay for it. Okay. Here's a question that came in uh, before the webinar. If someone uh, without diabetes has had a blood clot in the leg, is it a good idea for that person to be seen by a vascular surgeon for a PAD assessment? Or is this disease primarily seen in people who have diabetes? That's a great question too. So um, diabetes, <coughs> excuse me. Diabetes is certainly a major risk factor for PAD. And if you have diabetes, you're certainly more prone to get it. But you don't have, I certainly see this in a lot of people that don't have diabetes. So you don't have to have diabetes to get PAD. I'm, a, I'm not sure exactly how to answer the question because blood clot can mean a lot of things. So if you have a blood clot in the vein of your leg, that's called a DVT. That's a different thing. That's blood clots in the veins. You need blood thinner for that. That can also be dangerous, but a medical doctor or a hematologist can usually treat you for that. Although sometimes we see people with that. But if you had a blood clot in your arteries or someone's told you that you've had a blood clot in your arteries, that could be PAD, and you probably need to get that checked out. Okay. This person says he suffers from constant cold hands and feet. Is this a sign of PAD? That's a good question, too. A little hard to tell because that's kind of a general <laughs> symptom. But what does come to mind is if you have coldness in your hands and your feet, it may not be PAD because PAD doesn't hit the arms as much as it does the legs. And we could talk for a while about what, <coughs> what excuse me, about why that is. So if it's in your hands and your feet, what comes to mind for me is something called Raynaud's. So what's Raynaud's? Raynaud's means some people, the little tiny arteries in their hands and their feet get a little too overactive, especially in response to cold. So if you're if it's a cold time of the year, if you go out, it's a classic, classic example is people go out and grab a cold steering wheel and they get pain in their hands and they, sometimes their feet. Cold in some people causes the little arteries in their hands and their feet to spasm down and causes pain and discomfort and can even change colors, can get blue and red and white. That's called Raynaud's. Um, that's more of a Vase, it's more of a reactive thing and not so much of a blockage. So it doesn't sound like PAD to me, but still worth getting checked out and getting some simple ultrasounds to make sure. Okay, next question. Is numbness in the feet a sign of PAD or is it a case of damaged nerves? That's a great question too. Usually it's a nerve problem. And again, with diabetes, a lot of diabetic patients get neuropathy in their feet and in their hands, but a lot of times in their feet. So numbness and tingling in your feet is usually neuropathy. Because if you get numbness and tingling in your feet from PAD, that means you're pretty far along. 
That means you don't even have enough blood to keep the nerves going. So most people know that before it gets to that point. So usually when people come in to see me because of numbness or tingling, it's usually their diabetes um, or some kind of a neuropathy. Now, the only other thing I would say, Rana, is if, if you get numbness and tingling in one foot or numbness and tingling in one arm, well, what comes to mind that I would worry about then is a little mini stroke. So that's different than PAD, but I'm just going to say that so people know. So if you get if you get an arm or a leg that gets numb and tingles and won't do what you want it to do, like you go to reach for your coffee cup and you can't pick up the coffee cup, or you go to walk and the leg gives way, if you have numbness or tingling in one arm or one leg and those kind of problems, then the thing that would worry me the most would be like early warning signs of a small stroke. This next question is, what is ICPH? Yeah, that's a good question. That's a great question. So ICPH, it goes by many different names. It's the, the Center for Public. So it's the building across the street. It's where our offices are. So right now I'm in the hospital. I was in the hospital today. So right now I'm in Fairfax Hospital. But right across the street from Fairfax Hospital, they've renovated a building. You know, I think it used to be uh, I think it used to belong to ExxonMobil at one point. It's a huge building. It's They've renovated it beautifully. It's gorgeous. And so we've moved our offices and our clinics. That's where we would see the patients uh, in our clinic. And that's where we would try to do you know, our one-stop shopping, so to speak. We try to get everything done for you right there. Uh, we have our vascular lab right there. Our nurses are there. People can come in and sort of get everything done. And it's a beautiful facility. I got to say, they did a very nice job. Great parking, um, easy to get around. Lots of people to show you where you need to go if you get a little lost. Um, and just a beautiful facility. So that's across the street, and it's our kind of our clinic areas. Okay. Here's a question that came in uh, before the webinar. How do I know if I have a dangerous lesion versus just cracked skin? Oh, that's a good question, too. Um, <clears throat> you know, that's a tough one. <laughs> Um, it's hard to know sometimes, I think. I think, you know, you might want to have your medical doctor just take a look, you know, and feel for your pulse to make sure you have a pulse in your foot. A pulse, you can actually feel the blood supply. Like when you, you take your blood pressure, maybe at the drugstore, you can feel the pulse in your wrist. So um, it's sometimes hard to tell between just cracked skin and, and skin that's not getting enough circulation. So I think it depends a little bit on has this been happening? Is it chronic? Has this been happening for a long time? Then it's probably cracked skin. If it's something that just started happening more aggressively in a hurry, then I'd be worried that it's circulation. Okay. This person is asking how she can keep her blood pressure under control. She has, she apparently has PAD. Wow. If I knew that I'd get the Nobel prize, I'd be going to, <laughs> I'd be going to get my Nobel prize. Um, yeah, so blood pressure is a bit of a different thing. Blood pressure, blood pressure can cause PAD over time. PAD doesn't usually cause blood pressure problems. It's not the other way around. Now, you can get blockages in your kidney arteries. So if you have a blockage in the artery to your kidney, which is up in your belly, that can give you high blood pressure. But usually your medical doctor, that's a certain kind of high blood pressure. And the medical doctor is usually can figure that out. But so high blood pressure, PAD doesn't give you high blood pressure. And I would work with your medical doctors to treat your blood pressure. I don't have the answer to that. Um, but blood, high blood pressure can cause PAD over time. Does hip replacement surgery impact the vascular system in the affected leg? Um, how does this surgery affect circulation? That's a good, ooh, good question. That's a great question too. So hip surgery doesn't really affect the artery supply into your leg. Um, the only time we worry about that <coughs> is if someone has had, let's say, a stent put in or I have done a bypass, and then they need to get their hip replaced. Well, then I like to talk to the orthopedic guy and say, hey, watch out for my bypass. Don't hurt my bypass. But um, I, the biggest effect that hip replacement or knee replacement, so if you have a hip replaced or a knee replacement, as we said earlier tonight, that puts even more stress on your veins in your leg. So remember, we talked about the veins bringing the blood back to the heart. So I probably see a couple people every office hours 
who have had a hip replaced or they've had a knee replaced and they have swelling and nobody can figure out the swelling's coming from because their veins are okay. If you get an ultrasound test, the veins look okay. There's no, there's no DVT, there's no blockage, but they have swelling. Well, the swelling is because the hip replacement or the knee replacement throws off the vein function just a little bit and you can get some swelling in your leg after those kind of procedures. Mm -hmm. Okay. Next question is, do blood thinners like Eliquis make it harder to treat PAD? That's a great question too. So two things about Eliquis. Number one is Eliquis doesn't cure PAD. So some people think if they're on a blood thinner, it's going to cure their PAD. It doesn't. Now we use Eliquis sometimes in certain situations. Um, certainly after we treat somebody for PAD, we, then we might want them on the Eliquis. But Eliquis is really not a treatment for PAD. Now, there was a recent study that came out called the COMPASS trial. You guys don't have to worry about that. There's no test at the end of this. <laughs> so, so there was a trial called the COMPASS trial, which did show that a little tiny dose of a medicine called Xeralto, which is a cousin of, of Eliquis, they're in the same family, a little small dose of Xeralto helped people with PAD. And that was a very interesting trial. So now we're starting to rethink that a little bit. We are starting to think, if you come into my office now, um, I might look at you and suggest that, first of all, we have you on a, a, blood, pre a medicine for your, blood pressure medicine, a medicine for your cholesterol. If you have cholester high cholesterol, you need to be on a statin medicine, probably. So a blood pressure medicine, statin medicine, if your cholesterol is high, and then a small dose of this medicine, Xeralto, was shown to help PAD. I would say the biggest thing about Eliquis and that medicine, Xeralto, is if you are on it for another reason, and we then have to operate, we're going to have to stop it so we can operate. But that's a, probably one of the biggest effects of that. Okay. The next gentleman is saying he takes Pentox if Eileen? Right. Okay. Yeah. But it doesn't seem to relieve the pain. Is he supposed to be walking to make the medication effective? Yeah. So pentoxifiline, that's an old one. That's a that's one that I used to use when I was in practice back at Georgetown. So um the the new one is the one that I mentioned in the talk. It's called Platol, um, Salastazole, because what we found was the pentoxifiline, just as this gentleman. The pentoxifiline didn't help that many people. It helped some, um, but it didn't help as many people as we would have liked. So this medicine, Platol, is a cousin of pentoxifiline, seems to help more people. So I don't use the pentoxifiline anymore. Um, I use this Platol medicine, and we try that. But whichever one you use, whichever one you use, you should walk till you feel the discomfort and try to go a little further and then stop and rest and see if you can extend that distance a little bit over time. The next person says, my primary care physician gave me an order for ultrasound due to weak pulse in my foot. Good. Who should I see after the test or should I see you first? Yeah, that's a great question. <laughs> no, if you can get the test, go ahead and get the test because we would probably order it if we saw you anyway. So yeah, if your medical doctor ordered it, I would get the test. You know, some of the medical doctors can look at the test and know if you need to see me or not. Um, but some of them can't, and some of them just send people in. So I think it depends a little bit on who the medical doctor is. We certainly don't want to see, I mean, we can't see everybody that has a weak pulse, you know, but um, because there's a lot of people that uh, that have weak pulses as we get older. But so I think yeah, if you if you have uh, if you're not having bad symptoms and you just have a weak pulse and the medical doctor ordered the ultrasound, I would let the medical doctor take a look. And if they think you need to see a vascular surgeon, we would love to see you. Or if the medical doctor says, you know, I'm I'm not used to this. I want you to go have a vascular surgeon take a look. Then we'd be glad to see you. The next question is, is it common to have PAD in both legs? That's a great question, too. Yes, that's very common, actually. <laughs> so the body is amazingly like a mirror. It's really amazing. You know, when you when we when we fix things and work on people, it always amazes me how how symmetric people are, how, how bilateral they are. The blockers are in the same place. It's really amazing. 
which makes sense, I guess, because the body's amazing. But um, but that doesn't mean that both sides need to be treated. So almost always one side is worse than the other if we need to treat it. And we fix that side and then we watch the other side. Now, some people, when we fix one side, now that that side's fixed, they say, oh, now my other side hurts because that side's not limiting me anymore. That can happen. But um, but the point to the question is, yes, the body is very symmetric. So the blockages are often very similar, but usually only one leg gets gets kind of worse at a time. This next person says that he has had a pain in his right calf when exercising for 10 years wow. with little change, but now his carotids are 60% blocked. Should he be worried about PAD? Well, it sounds like he does have <coughs> some atherosclerosis, although if you've had it for 10 years, that's pretty pretty slowly progressive. So that's that's good. You're controlling it. So that's good. I hope you stop smoking. Um now, so yeah, so it sounds like you probably have some PAD, but it sounds like it's not limiting you or impacting you or dangerous in terms of the carotid arteries. So 60% blockage if you're not having any symptoms. So if you're not having one of those little mini strokes, those they're called TIAs or transient ischemic attacks. Yeah, if you have no history of stroke, no history of TIA, then 60% is not bad enough to fix but we still need to keep an eye on it. So if somebody comes in to me with a 60% blockage in their carotid artery, we do the ultrasound, make sure that that's right. We make sure they stop smoking, make sure their blood pressure is controlled. We do all the things um, to treat their PAD because it's kind of PAD of the neck instead of the leg. Um, and then I see them back in three months and we would repeat the ultrasound in three months. And we would only fix the carotid artery if, if we saw it getting worse right in front of us on that three-month ultrasound. So if somebody comes in and it's 60% and I see him three months later and it's now 80%, well, that's getting, that's getting worse kind of fast. So we'd probably fix that for you. Or if you had one of those little mini warning strokes, then we would definitely fix it for you. But a 60% blockage in and of itself, not causing any problems needs to be followed, but I wouldn't necessarily suggest that that gets fixed. Is ANOVA involved in any clinical trials for those with PAD who are at risk of ischemia in their limbs? Yeah, we're, we're a lot. Of, so I've built my career on clinical trials. So yes, so we're involved in a lot of clinical trials. We're involved um, at this point in time, mostly, <laughs> excuse me, mostly, <laughs> sorry, mostly interventional trials. So we've got trials with certain kinds of bypasses, We've got trials with certain kinds of special stents and special kinds of balloons. Um, we're not engaged in that many medically oriented trials at the moment, but we're looking to hire a vascular medicine physician to help us with that. But yes, we have uh, lots of clinical trials ongoing. Does the danger of PAD um, increase with age? That's a good question. I would say the, the incidence or the chance of getting PAD definitely increases with age. The risk of it, uh, not necessarily. So once you've got it, then you, then a certain proportion of people will have the kind of problems that we need to fix, which is what we showed the pictures of earlier. But I think there definitely is a, a preponderance or a, an increased risk of getting it as we age. Like I said in that one slide, once you get to the age of 70, um, about one in three people will have some amount of PAD. What is silent ischemia and why are diabetics more at risk? Well, silent ischemia is something that the heart doctors talk a lot about, that you can get, you can get blockages in your arteries which cause the tissue of the leg or the heart to not get enough blood, but don't cause a lot of pain. So for example, people that have diabetes, as we mentioned earlier, in their feet and their low extremities, they get neuropathy, so they can't feel. They they have they lose the ability to feel very well in their foot. So I've had people that come into my office, they get sent in, usually diabetic, because they have a sore on usually the bottom of their foot that they didn't even know they had. And their medical doctor took their shoe off and said, oh my gosh, you have a sore. And then we have to get them more blood to get that sore to heal. Well, they didn't know they had the sore because they can't see it, it's on the bottom of their foot, and with the diabetes, they don't have such great feeling or such great sensation. 
So silent ischemia means lack of circulation that you can't really, it's not causing pain, you can't feel it because you have decreased sensation, like I said, usually from diabetes. Okay. We may have answered a question similar to this one. This question is, is a history of DVT a risk for PAD? That's a great question too. It's actually not. So uh, DVT, as we said, is clots in your veins. So it doesn't make you an increased risk for PAD. But the thing about DVT or clots in your veins is you have to make sure that you're not prone to clot. So some people that get DVTs, when they go to their medical doctor and sometimes to a hematologist, they're found to have a clotting abnormality and they're a little more prone to clot. And then you have to get treated for that. So if you're more prone to clot, then you can get PAD. But DVT itself doesn't directly make you at increased risk for, uh, for PAD. Okay. Uh, this might be our last question. This person okay. is asking, what kind of medications uh, reduce the chances of losing a limb from ischemia? So that's a great question, too. So it's, it has to do with those risk factors we talked about. If you can reduce your risk factors for PAD and reduce the the, 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 the rapidity or the, the progress at which PAD is growing. And what is that? Well, remember that stop smoking. That's the big one. You just can't smoke. <laughs> and I know it's hard. Trust me, I know it's hard. I've had a lot of patients over the years that just can't give up tobacco. But if you can, it's really worth doing. Then, uh, you know, medicines for your, if you have high cholesterol, even if you don't have real high cholesterol, some of the studies are showing that a little bit of a statin drug can help you with PAD. So blood pressure medicine, a statin drug, possibly a little low dose of that Xeralto medicine, which is the cousin of, of Eliquis to, to prevent any clotting in the arteries. Um, and then diabetes medication. You gotta make sure you control your insulin. So insulin medicine, cholesterol medicine, a little small dose of Xeralto maybe, stopping smoking. Those are the big things. Okay, thank you. That was terrific, Dr. Neville. We really learned a lot this evening. Um, and thank you everyone for attending today's webinar. If you have additional questions, feel free to email them to me. Um, Quine, perhaps you could put my email or your email in the chat. Once you leave today's webinar, our survey will pop up on your screen and we would really appreciate it if you could complete that survey because we would like to have your feedback. And you will also receive a follow-up email in about a week that will include um, the entire recording as well as Dr. Neville's slides. So on behalf of Inova, thank you again for joining us and have a great evening. Good night, everybody. Good night.